So um, I see that it's 3.30, so I'm unmuting myself. Welcome to Porcupine Love, dealing with dysregulated behaviors in long-term romantic relationships where one partner has BPD or its symptoms. My name is Kathleen Payne, and I have had the mental health condition called borderline personality disorder for over 50 years. Everyone with this condition has their own experience of it, and I can only talk from my own experience. I realize some of the things I say may be painful to hear, and I urge you two things up front. One, if you need to take a break at any time to take care of yourself during this workshop or during listening to the recording later, please do so. Please do whatever you need to to take care of yourself. The second thing I urge is that if I talk about something that has worked for me, you have to decide what will work for you. If some particular tip or tool or suggestion that I mentioned doesn't speak to you or work for you, please feel free to disregard it and turn to something that does work for you. I am not a therapist and I cannot act as a therapist, only speaking to you as someone with the condition. I've been through approximately three year long specialized treatments of BPD called dialectical behavioral therapy, where you go twice a week for 10 to 12 months, one time a week for individual therapy and one time a week for group therapy. Apparently I'm a slow learner or at least I've needed to get some refreshers. Um, I think it's been three courses over the 17 years. But how did it all start? I don't really know, but I do have evidence that when I was 10 years old, I wrote in my diary, mommy yelled at me today. I wish I were dead. For many years, I had no name for what this was. I actually had no concept really of what was going on with me. I just knew I hurt, I hurt a lot. I felt unloved, unlovable, inadequate in so many ways. And I thought, if only someone would love me, then I would be fine. Obviously there was much more to it that was going on. I assume most of the listeners here in this audience know about the nine symptoms of emotion dysregulation of which one needs five to get the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. My particular symptoms have been low self-esteem and unstable self-image, two, intense moods that rapidly change, three, intense anger, sometimes repressed, but always at inappropriate levels for the situation, four, fear of abandonment, real or imagined abandonment, five, my chronic feelings of loneliness and emptiness, Six, I probably break with reality during most of my emotional dysregulation and behaviors. And the seventh symptom I've had from time to time in my life is suicidal thoughts and behaviors. I have been fortunate to not have had all nine of the symptoms of this condition, but I do certainly have compassion for those that do. I do need to let you know that what my husband and I have developed and what I'm talking about to you today has come after many long years of hardship and pain and suffering and tears. And I still struggle to this day with trying to act on what I've learned when I'm in the throes of sobbing and yelling, I don't know what to do. And I still have so much pain and anguish and yes, shame about the horrible things that come out of my mouth and that I've done in my life and continue to say and do to this day. But today I will be talking about how my partner of 36 years and counting deal with my dysregulated behaviors, which come from what I call the borderline brain. My hope is that what I've developed, what my husband and I have developed out of our struggles might ease the way forward for other couples where one has BPD or its symptoms of emotion dysregulation, that is feeling emotions way out of proportion, 
to the situation. So what is the borderline brain? Well, if you Google borderline brain scan, you will get something like what I have here on my, on my slide. We can tell from brain scans of people without the above line and people with borderline that there is something not quite right about the brain, the borderline brain. Scientists are still trying to learn exactly what it means, but so far we think that the rational part of the brain, like cortex, is not necessarily connecting correctly with the part of the brain that is responsible for the fight or flight response called the amygdala. So that our fight or flight responses are really going haywire. I've heard some scientists call it the amygdala hijack, where the amygdala inappropriately takes over control of the brain. This was crucial when a saber-toothed tiger suddenly jumped out into the path of my forebears. And my husband often jokes that he's married to Kathleen's amygdala. But one thing I often say is, I can't remember what I had for lunch, but boy, that part of my brain that was designed to help me 10,000 years ago is rock solid. Well, maybe it would be helpful to give you an example of the borderline brain. Imagine that it's dinner time in a normal late afternoon of a homemaker who has been home with the kids, helping them with their homework and cooking several things on the stove to get ready for dinner. And the hubby comes in from work and our family is sitting down to dinner really kind of in a rushed way where everything is like quickly coming out of the oven and being put on the table. So just for when the husband comes to the table and the hubby sits down and says, could you please pass a fork? And I suddenly feel horrible. Everything inside me is screaming. I'm doing everything here, helping the kids with their homework, getting everything to come out of the oven right when you get home all at the same time, serving it up just when you're waltzing in the door. And now you're telling me I didn't even get the table set right. Thanks for the criticism. I can't stand it. It hurts. It feels like you don't love me at all. Or maybe you never love me. Why did you even marry me if I can't set the table correctly? I'm so inadequate. And what's worse, you think I'm inadequate. You hate me and I hate you too. It's horrible. Stop it. Make it stop. Can't you see I'm in pain? Can't you do something? Oh my gosh, I have to leave the room. So I leave the room crying and sobbing so hard I can hardly breathe. I go into the other room to get away from my source of pain, which is you. I think everyone would be better off without me. I hate everything. I hate living. That's just one example of the borderline brain, bringing instant feelings of pain and hopelessness. And this is only one moment of one day. There will be dozens and dozens of these moments in the day, the week, the month, it will happen over and over and over. Forgiveness is nice and I do try to ask for it, but these emotional storms are not about forgiveness. They will keep coming back. There is no denying that this mental health condition is with me. It will come out, especially in the one relationship that means the most to you. I call them emotional storms and they are a part of life with a partner with BPD. Since they will not go away, my life is all about what are we going to do to cope with this brain condition? So I found some visuals on the internet for an emotional storm. The first photo I found is from NASA and it had the word typhoon in the caption, something that just takes over completely, covers the landscape, takes, into, takes over everything and everyone that surrounds me. The second one I found is a dozen lightning flashes coming down all at once, which represent the hurtful emotional words that come out of me all at once. Maybe those of you who experience emotion dysregulation and feeling your feelings way more intensely than the situation calls for will want to experiment and search the internet for a good visual for you that matches your internal experience. For women who've experienced childbirth, 
maybe you can relate to the physically devastating back-to-back -back contractions that just won't stop, that seem to be coming from inside of you and not in your control. So I like that one, but not everyone has felt that experience. So I tend to st stick with the words, emotional storm. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So what is an emotional storm like? It hurts. If there's anyone who understands pain, it's a person with a BPD or emotion dysregulation. When you are triggered, you are in so much pain. I believe you really don't have any bandwidth in your psyche, in your head for anything but that pain at that moment. It is all encompassing. You feel like your partner has just stung you with their quills and your partner feels like you've stung them with your quills. That's how I came up with the idea of two porcupines. You each fill the quills of the other. And I add here, you are two porcupines in love. You love each other, even though you experience each other's quills. You also know the loving parts of one another and you love those. My website that I came up with where I post my blogs for couples where one has emotion dysregulation or BPD is found at www.porcupinelove.com. Emphasis on the love, which I believe is a beautiful thing. And I believe everyone who wants to have a long-term romantic relationship deserves to have one, at least have a fighting chance of having one, which is what I hope I'm sharing my story with you today. Maybe you'll even say, wow, if this lady expects me to have room in my psyche for my partner and their feelings about me and my behaviors, she just doesn't have borderline like I have borderline. And I'm not here to say what level of borderline I have. I said, everyone has their own experience, which I don't care to judge, but believe me, I have been in the dark pit many, many times, including five times in that abysmal pit of suicide, which I am not going to talk about here today. But I am appealing to you or the part of you, maybe it's only a teeny tiny part of an inch of, a, of your psyche when you're triggered, but probably much larger when you're not triggered, that really doesn't want to have your pain control your life, that doesn't want your partner to only be a nursemaid to you while you're in your hospital bed, that part of you who wants to live in a world where you can stand on your own two feet in the relationship, who wants more than a life of running like a hamster in a wheel, of endlessly repeating times of excruciating pain over and over, and that actually wants to create a world where you can be in a sustainable long-term relationship. If the person with BPD is thinking along the lines of, well, my partner's pain is nowhere near my amount of pain. You just have to put that kind of thinking behind you. It's a non-starter. Pain is pain and everyone knows it. You could even use your understanding of excruciating pain to help you hear others' pain, hear your partner's pain. That's one good thing about emotional sensitivity. You can't say you don't understand pain. So everyone knows that any kind of long-term romantic relationship means give and take, you get that. And sometimes in life, one partner actually feels like they're giving 100% when the other partner can't or won't give anything. That's what I call being a patient in a hospital bed. When your partner is really caring for you and you are just receiving their care, you're not really doing or able to do anything for them at that point in time. There just are times like that in life. So we talk about sustainability. You want that, you want that sustainability over time. And research tells us that while every romantic relationship encounters conflict or troubles, the thing that results in sustaining that relationship over time is doing repairs after the trouble or the conflict. It comes when you can repair the things that you do that hurt the other. But listening to your partner say, it really hurts me when you're yelling things at me because it feels like you don't respect me as a person. 
and I'm not important enough for you to treat me with respect. I mean, don't you want to treat me with respect? Yikes. And the emotional storms keep coming and they keep coming many moments in the day and many moments in the week and on and on. Double yikes. What are you going to do about this brain condition that you have? Pretending the emotional storms don't happen is a non-starter. And pretending this comes across as saying to your partner that the relationship just isn't enough, important enough to you to do anything else. Is that really the message you wanna send? No, you know the relationship is important. So what are you going to do differently? I get that in life, you have some choices. I do understand how horrible it is to have the thought that unendurable pain is going to last the rest of my life together with this person and wanting and needing that not to happen. So that's why people divorce or break up. It doesn't even seem healthy to just stay and suffer and be miserable with so much daily pain. Some say our scars make us stronger, but not everyone can just take it and be okay. I know I just can't take it and be okay. So yes, I don't wanna break it off either. What a conundrum. How do we work things out and go forward? So I say from years and years of crying and raging and struggling, what helped me? I had to lean into that 1 64th of an inch in my psyche that wants to be in my long-term relationship more than I want my pain to control my life. If I lean into my compassion for my partner, I can learn to listen to their pain about me, even if it's only for 60 seconds. And that's how we came up with this 60 second repair. I found that if I listened to my partner's feelings about me and my emotional storm behaviors for much longer than 60 seconds, I started back into that downward spiral of thinking, I can't do anything right. I, I, they'd be much better off without me and so on. So I said, I can listen to your feelings and validate your experience about me for about 60 seconds. And that's how we started doing the repairs after an emotional storm that we now call a 60. So I'm calling on you. It's time to find your superpower of hearing your partner's feelings about your behaviors and validate your partner's experience of your emotional storms. It takes courage to look at yourself, what you say, what you've done, how you've said it, how you've done it. And it takes courage to look at your feelings and to list them as connected to certain behaviors that you can observe, physical things, not things you characterize as that was snide or that was mean or you're so horrible, no characterizations here. It takes courage to hear your partner's feelings about your observable behavior and validate their experience of your emotional storms. Even if it's only for 60 seconds, that 60 seconds is the beginning of you building your long-term relationship. I'm here to say that it's my job as a person with a BPD brain to find that 1 64th of an inch in my psyche. No one else can do it for me. My partner can't do it for me. My therapist cannot do it for me. I have to lean into that part of me that makes a conscious commitment, even when I don't feel like it, even if I have to bite the insides of my cheeks for 30 of the 60 seconds I'm listening to my partner's feelings. And I, if I can do it, I think you can do it too. One tip that has helped my husband and I navigate these difficult issues is that he asked for, and I wrote him a playbook. He asked, for me to answer four questions about what it is like to have borderline or emotional dysregulation. For him to just know about me in general, 
but also specifically to know in advance of my emotional storms. There are four questions that we came up with that everyone can consider answering after this webinar about themselves to give to your partner. That should be, they should be in a handout for all participants in this webinar. I'm gonna go in depth about each of these four questions on the next four slides where I will give you my answers that I've given to my husband so that he has this information in advance in general, and also that he knows these things about me during the emotional storms. He, the first question in my playbook is, what physical sensations, thoughts, and beliefs do I have when I'm in the middle of an emotional storm? I tried several different versions of trying to describe what it's like for me during an emotional storm. I tried saying, imagine you're two years old and one of your parents, one of the only persons in your whole world right then is screaming in your ear three inches from your face, I hate you. And you don't have the ability to communicate or to identify or process your thoughts. My husband said that didn't really make sense to him. I also heard Marshall Linehan describe it as if you, if you have third degree burns all over your arm and all you have a slightest, oh, very slightest touch to the skin and you react way out of proportion to that very slight touch. But now I pretty much just am sticking with the description of a red hot poker jabbing me once every second for every second and every second after that, 60 times for every minute of the emotional storm. I think most people can imagine that pretty easily. This next question in my playbook that I want to explain to my partner is, why is it so hard for me to just stop, stop myself from saying and doing these things that are so hurtful to my partner? I want him to know ahead of time that during an emotional storm, there really is no room in me, in my brain, in my psyche, for anything else but the pain. Not him, not um, how much he means to me, not how much he matters and that our relationship matters. Nothing, nada, nothing except it hurts, make it stop. The third question in my playbook that I want to answer or that you might wanna answer for your partner is, what is your plan? for this emotional storm when it happens. I want to tell my partner that I have a plan that I'm committed to putting into place each and every time I can during an emotional storm. I tell my partner that I will do everything to ingrain it into my being. I have cards all over the house, in every drawer that I often open, in my purse, taped under my bathroom mirror, wherever you can think of to have reminders to yourself that you will see everywhere, every day. I wanna tell my partner that sometimes I may do better at following my plan than at other times. And I write down what my plan is. My first step is to say, I'm too upset to talk. My second step is to say, breathe. My third step is don't talk when upset because talking out of upsetness is going to pour poison on this relationship. Some people need to move around or go for a walk or go to another room. You might wanna go look at something or try to describe its color, its texture, its smell, its taste, what it sounds like. Or you might have to do an opposite action like plunging your hands into ice. Whatever mindfulness or other practices you and your therapist may have developed to break you out of your emotional reaction. Some people need to physically move and they just take a walk. Sometimes for myself, I just write down everything I wanna scream at the moment until it quiets down. Or sometimes I write, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts over and over and over until it stops or slows the hurt down. Every individual is different as to what works for you. And I think it's your job to come up with and stick to a plan that you are committed to do when you are in an emotional storm. But no matter what your plan is that you create, my husband and I have discovered the last step of your plan needs to be 
the most very crucial step of your plan needs to be how you will come back to your partner and repair after the emotional storm. You can say how long you need for that repair to happen. You can even say several times, I'm still too upset to talk. I'm still upset, too upset to repair until you feel less so. And then you can set a time for that to happen. Maybe you say, I'll be back in an hour. I'll talk with you after work, whatever works for you and your partner. And I get not every partner is perfect either. Maybe part of their vulnerabilities, how hard it is for them to wait for you to come back and repair. And that's just another part of the awareness that you'll have to work into your plan and put in your playbook ahead of time. At one point we had strategies for communicating in four different quadrants. The first quadrant is where neither my husband nor I are upset. And this is how we wanna communicate. Then there's a quadrant for, I'm upset, but my partner isn't. Or then there's a quadrant for my partner's upset, but I'm not. And the last one is when both my partner and I are upset. Double yikes. That quadrant, there might be a future blog post on my website about later. So there are many different things that my, on the fourth question in, the, in my playbook that you might want to say to your partner so that they know about you during the times when you're upset. You might want to say that you want them to keep in their mind about you for during the hard times, to keep in their mind about you for during the times that you are exploding, experiencing triggers or your times of dysregulation. It might just be that you want them to remember that you do really love them and you want good things for them and for the two of you. You might want them to remember that your brain is flaring up and it hurts and hurts, hurts so much more than you can even stand. I want my partner to remember that it feels like someone is stabbing me in the gut with a red hot poker every second, 60 times for a minute that goes by. And that it feels like someone is doing it to me, that it's not coming from inside me. It just feels like I'm reacting to pain. I might want to remind him, although he already knows this, so I'm not too often, that I didn't ask for this borderline brain and I sure wish I didn't have it. I especially want my partner to know my emotional storms are just part of who I am. I don't intend or want to hurt you with them and I am so sad and sorry about what I do that hurts you. I often say, I am just going to be extremely sensitive to many things that have nothing to do with you. But always I try to say, I will come back to you after my lashing out when I calm down and I'm not so in so much pain. So after you, you've had time to write your playbook, write your partner a playbook and share it with each other, maybe even review it several times with them so that they kind of understand a little bit more about what it's like to have an emotional storm. You come up with your plan that you are going to put in place after every emotional storm and you've written it down and reminded yourself all over the place what you are committed to doing then you're maybe ready to try it out. I'm sure there are no, gonna be no shortage of emotional storms to work with, but you are going to remember after the next one that you are going to try to do some type of repair afterwards. You can look at your notes all over the house or whatever you need to do to remember what to do. Just remember when you calm down after a storm, you're going to do what we call a three part 60. A 60 has three parts. One, listen to your partner's experience of your storm. Two, validate your partner's experience of your storm. And three, ask what you can do differently. Under listen, you're offering at least 60 seconds. You can say, I'm available to give you a 60. And that means I'm going to listen to your feelings about my behaviors for 60 seconds and validate your experience by number one, saying that it what, what it was that I did do. Number two, understand their feelings about that for a minute at least. 
Once I've listened actively to my partner and validated them as best I can, I ask, did I hear you accurately? And is there more? And then I ask, what can I or we do differently next time? If you don't do this last step, it can seem like it will just be repeating endlessly throughout all the time ahead of you, which is similar to saying that relationship and your partner don't really matter enough to do anything else. So breaking it down further, the first step is that I'm going to say, I hear you saying you felt hurt. You felt angry. You felt sad. You felt scared when you heard me doing something observable. For me, it's a harsh, scolding tone of voice, loud volume, and negative words about my partner. Step two. In the, second, in the second step of the 60 repair, my husband and I have discovered that my partner could really use me telling him that their feelings about me make sense. I can acknowledge what I did and that I did certain things. And I can say, I'm sorry that I did those things if I am. Remember, in any long-term relationship, trust is so important. If you start embedding any lies or untruths or saying sorry when you're not, I believe that will erode the long-term relationship. I haven't done any research on this point, but I think there probably is something out there that says that. My husband says I wear my heart on my sleeve, so it's pretty hard for me to say things that aren't sincere, but everyone is fallible, everyone is human, and hopefully your conscience will keep you on the path of telling the truth. As step three of our part three part 60 repair, you need to ask yourself, if I don't do anything differently, what message am I sending to my partner? That they don't matter enough to me to try something else? That I want to repeat the same scenario over and over again, like a hamster on a wheel, hurting my loved one over and over and over and expecting different results in my relationship? That's the definition of insanity, right? So what are you going to do differently? Hopefully repair every time there you have a dysregulated behaviors. I know that's asking a lot. And I know it's hard every single time. And I don't always do it myself. And then my partner starts playing repair police and that doesn't go over very well either. You can only do your best. Only you can ask yourself what you need to do to change. And you can try it the next time you fall off the wagon. And next time it might be better or it might go easier. Or next time it might be another disaster. But certainly the more you do it, the more likely you will be to keep doing it. But I have to say it's never easy. Sometimes you or your partner have particular vulnerabilities that make it harder at some times than at others. That's what we call self-awareness and gauging yourself. And those are skills that you have to build over time. When I know we are about to discuss something where our emotions are gonna run deep, I just say, just remember, I'm particularly sensitive about a lot of things. And that is totally about me and the way I'm wired. It is not about anything else, period. To provide a 60, it helps for you to be first aware of your own feelings and why you're having them so that you can hold them in check to make space to hear and validate your partner's feelings about you. This is extra hard to do when you have BPD. As part of my everyday self-care routine, I have a regular daily mantra I go through in my mind every day. Have I gotten good sleep? Am I keeping my blood sugar levels where they need to be? Did I do my 30 minute walk or my aerobics class for seniors three times this week? Did I do my 30 minute quiet time, my mindfulness practice this morning? Did I take all my meds the way I'm supposed to? Am I keeping up with any therapy that I need? I recommend checking in with yourself daily and also ask myself these same questions when I need, feel like I need to do a 60 for my partner and need to gauge my availability my availability to do that. 
Kathleen, you have five minutes. All right. I am going to do um, just a little hypothetical uh, so you can kind of see my process of how this works. So imagine that we just had a vacation where I had expressed how sad I was that I didn't feel there was enough time for the two of us just to talk each day. I had suggested during the vacation, even though we had never done this before, and I know many couples do, that we do a happy half hour with no alcohol, where we just check in with each other for a half an hour to see how things were going for the other that day. First day back at work, I texted my partner in the morning saying, I hope he felt rested from his week away and that he was having a good day. The happy half hour came and went without so much as a whisper of any acknowledgement that we had agreed on it. I headed to bed around 9.45, which is my usual. Around 9.50, I heard the garage door open and he came to where I was reading in bed to talk to me without saying anything about the time or the happy half hour. And he said that he'd been looking forward to talk with me and I said, when I hear the garage door going up at 9.50 p.m., when I'm in bed reading, I don't get the message you want to talk with me. I think you're giving me the message that you don't care enough about me to want to talk to me. Oops. How much better it would have been if I could have said how hurt I was as when 7.30 came and went without any acknowledgement of our happy half hour arrangement and how much more hurt I felt when I went up to bed at 9.45 without hearing from him in the evening and even felt more hurt when I heard the garage door go up at 9.50 and him coming in without any mention of any of the above. How I wish he could have come home with that being the first thing out of his mouth. If I could have just said, I just feel so hurt and sad, he probably would have melted. We can even brainstorm about what I or we could do differently. I mean, maybe I could text him at 7.15 saying, I'm looking forward to checking in with you at 7.30. Or I could just do that, even if we hadn't texted ahead of time. My friend at NEA, Tina Moore, calls that unilateral problem solving. Plus, we could have also been aware that talking to each other at 9.50 at night, when both of us are depleted, is not going to go well. But what I could, when I come back and do my 60 second repair for what I did say, I tell him how I can imagine how hurt and sad he was that when he came up to talk to me that night, all I did was speak to him in a harsh tone of voice, loud volume with negative words about him and how sorry and sad I am about doing those things. And it is true that I did those things and that I can hear his hurt and sadness about that. How sorry I am for those behaviors and that he went through that situation with me and what I or we could do differently next time. So it only takes 60 seconds to run through that. I know it's hard and I know it can make a huge difference in your lives. So I'm going to conclude with some remarks that after all these years of crying and raging and struggling with a husband who obviously loves me still, who still sees I have some good parts to me and that I am still going into my emotional storms, that's why I say it's so hard. Even after many years of trying hundreds of different things, talking endlessly and forever about what can we do differently and still have my amygdala take over with this instant heart, impulse to start raging. Sometimes I'm able to stick to my plan and stop myself talking. And sometimes I don't do so well with that. But at least I have a plan and I know what I'm up against. It's that stabbing every second with the red hot poker while I'm in my emotional storm. And I think what has been most helpful to me is the fact that I have been through it so many times that I know the key word is through it. I've experienced unendurable pain so many, many, many times that I do know that
there will be the other side of it, the times when I'm not dysregulated. I know I can and will get to the other side of it, even when I don't think so at the time. I mean, I can't really remind myself in the middle of it that it will pass like a storm, but because I don't have access to that thinking part of my brain. It's only later that I realize, hey, I don't feel like I'm in the fiery furnace anymore. I'm not feeling like somebody is jabbing me every second. Maybe it's only once a minute, or maybe it's now only once every five minutes. I wait and it does dissipate. And then I do crave reconnection with my partner. So maybe then I can go and offer to give him a 60 second validation, 60 second repair. My hope is that you and your partner might also be able to find a way to do the repairs that make all the difference in helping your long-term relationship with a person with emotion dysregulation last over time. Please start with a situation that is not huge in the scheme of your life. I know, I know that there's no such thing as an emotional storm that's not huge, but start with something that's a relatively um, small in your life scheme and not anything life threatening. Be gentle with yourself when you're trying this out. Love is a beautiful thing. And I believe that everyone who wants to be in a long-term romantic relationship deserves to be in one, at least to have a fighting chance of making it work. I hope this webinar has been helpful and hopeful. If you would like to read more tips or tools or information that I, my husband of 36 years and counting marriage have come up with, please come to my website, www.porcupinelove.com. And don't forget the love. I'm sending you all my love fighting this most painful of mental health conditions. And now I have a few minutes left. I think only probably three minutes left for a couple questions. I'm sorry, I didn't leave more time. But I do want to say, if you have a question you'd like me to address, if you put them in the chat, I will try to reach out to you after the conference to answer your questions. But I don't know if, um, David, did you see a question that I might tackle? I don't see any questions yet. But again, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat box. And if we don't get to them, I'll try to keep a list of them so that Kathleen can reach back out to you afterwards and help you as best as she can. Kathleen, I have a question. Knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself right before you got married 30 something years ago? Hmm. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I think I would have to say that um, when that you have this condition, it's not what people regularly deal with, and that that I'm going to need some help along the way. I think that I would say to myself. I've been feeling so hurt, so hurt and so upset so many times in my life that I know it's going to go into whatever relationship I have in the future, including my marriage, because I had it with my parents before my marriage and I just transferred it to my husband after my marriage. So I think I would tell myself I need to get some help. Any other questions? Kathleen, Ann posted in the chat, when did you become aware that you had BPD? Oh, um, it was a long and undiagnosed problem from many care providers. Uh, it's a long harrowing story, but I was about 40, 45 uh, when I finally had an interaction with my therapist who said, oh, we knew you had borderline when you walked in and I'd been with, under his care for like two years. I said, but you didn't tell me that? So it was very disconcerting and it took me a while. I didn't even want the diagnosis. I was really angry at my husband for taking family connections because I said, are you a psychiatrist now that you can diagnose me with borderline? I was really upset, but when he learned how to validate me and we started getting, I started saying he got a lot better. 
he could validate me and I could actually deal with that a lot better. So it took me a long time to actually embrace the, the diagnosis once I had it. I think it is like 4.15. So I hate to cut anyone off, but I think we need to let be respectful of everyone's time and let people go on to their break. And don't forget Brandon Marshall is next talking about having borderline in the NFL. Quite the story. Good luck to everyone. Thank you.